League of Legends released in the year 2009 and has been an ever-changing experience since those days. So much changes year to year in this game that it's even possible for me to make entire 20 minute history videos on each champion's individual history. However, where this becomes blurry is when you discuss how much versus how little change is necessary. This is the basis for Doublelist's video that he put out last year. The main argument is that a game like Super Smash Bros. or StarCraft, despite receiving no changes for years upon years, will have players adapt and change metas on their own. This means that given enough time, players adapt and change the meta, whereas the game doesn't have to. I do think this is a solid argument but not flawless, and I think it's something that I would like to discuss today. This video is meant to be an open discussion though, and not at all a one-sided soapbox. I want to give an alternate perspective while still tying in the idea that change is inevitable, but can be done in a correct way. There are two sides to the story, and you have veterans of both sides of the coin. You have some who live in tradition, the past, and in the glory days. Tarzan in his season 6 graves, Tyler 1 in his season 7 draven build with Yomus and QSS, Hashinshin in the bruiser heyday. You have people who want things to stay very close to their roots, and minimal evolution to the game. Oh, and then he can cast it again. Okay, that seems a bit excessive. You also have players who value change, embrace it, and think it's pretty cool. That's sick. Oh, what the fuck? Rise Give me a three cents, up, brothers what? and sisters. Whatever they bring, we'll match it. Crush the oppressors. Claim your birthright. And burn their kingdom to the ground. All we need to what start the fuck? fire. That was cool as hell. Change brings new life, new refreshing content, and new ideas. Riot has also completely redone and refreshed the lore of League of Legends every single patch, and there are new updates to the lore all the time. Even skins now have their own bios in the client, and I bet some of you didn't even know that. That being said, there are more reasons than just one why a game should receive some changes. It's not all about nostalgia, and it's not just about making a champion who can steal your ult, steal your summoner spells, disguise as a teammate, steal your girlfriend, etc. There's a lot more to it than that, and to fully understand it, we have to talk about basketball and go back in time to the year 1950. NBA basketball is one of the most exciting sports, and by modern standards, it has everything. Fast-paced gameplay, world-class athletic maneuvers, and is appealing to both a young crowd and old traditionalists. It, much like a lot of things in life, didn't start that way. And in the year 1950, the NBA had a problem, and it was exacerbated in the worst game of all time. November 22nd, 1950. The Fort Wayne Pistons beat the Minneapolis Lakers 19-18. This is the lowest scoring game in NBA history. Why? Well, at the time, the Lakers were the best team in the league. The Fort Wayne Pistons knew they were completely outclassed, and their coach told them to do none other than pass the ball around. A lot. They simply held the ball as long as they could. They utterly ruined the entire game. The Pistons said, we can't win in a traditional way, so let's cheese the crap out of them. And that's exactly what they did. Needless to say, many people left the game, and the Lakers coach after the game spoke on how this is a disgrace on the game of basketball. In 1954, the NBA made a big change and added the 24 second shot clock, meaning that a team in every possession must take their shot within 24 seconds to ensure that a situation like this and this type of game would never happen again. Plenty of sports change over time. Vox uploaded one of my favorite videos on all of YouTube describing how Major League Baseball is boring and the MLB is trying to appeal to a younger audience and speed up the game. The game is considerably slow and dull and requires many hours invested just to watch a game. These all fall under the idea of fixing boring gameplay, but there are several reasons why an organization might make some changes. If a player or individual is too dominant, such as Wilt Chamberlain in NBA basketball, who has had countless rules changed because of him and him alone, it can also spark changes in a system. While certain individuals in real sports could get things changed, the way I like to look at this and how it applies to League of Legends is by specific interactions. At times, certain champions, 
runes and items must be nerfed due to their interaction with one another or their synergy, causing them to single-handedly break the game. Some of my favorite examples throughout League's history are things such as mid lane Runeglaive Smite, where champions such as Ezreal, Diana, or Orianna could go mid lane and take Smite and build the new OP Runeglaive. This made them incredibly powerful and also quite hard to duel. Ezreal was particularly broken at the time with this, building an AP Ezreal build. Oh, and by the way, this is back as of a couple of weeks ago. Dopa has been playing that Spellbook Orianna mid lane, and apparently mid smite Orianna after they buff Runic Echoes to 80 AP is once again good. History loves to repeat itself. There was also a time that you could take Smite in the top lane and building Cinderhawk as soon as it was buffed. This was crazy for tanky champions and of course was crazy for junglers, but if your name is Huni, you could play Smite Lee Sin tank top. GP and Ezreal synergy with Kleptomancy when it was first released in Season 8 was so incredibly high that GP became a relevant and OP champion for nearly the entire season and was repeatedly nerfed. Karma and Lulu top lane with Kleptomancy and Spell Thieves, known as the Frostmancy build, was nerfed almost as soon as it became popular. The amount of gold that you would get simply by just hitting your lane opponent and ignoring farming made it entirely too unfair. Banner of Command had a host of problems during its days as a League item, and despite their best efforts at times to change, rework, and reimagine the item, Riot admitted it was unhealthy and had to be removed. It simply couldn't be balanced, so it had to bite the bullet. They're hot fixing again? Nice! How did it even make it in live? How? Sweet, guys! They're hot fixing it! Cool! That's awesome and all! How did it even make it to live servers? How? How did they think that was okay to even put it in the game? These types of individual removals and changes aren't the only major things that needed a makeover in League of Legends. I think the shot clock example in basketball is quite similar to the forced removal of lane swaps by Riot. Lane swaps were an ever popular strategy in competitive play. The idea of taking your bot lane to the top lane or your top laner to the bottom lane to grab a tower early and essentially give your ADC uncontested free farm was an interesting take to the early game strategy. However, it came with several problems. Firstly, it would screw your top laner. Like, hard. Like, really, really hard. Top laners would often be left with little to no resources, and the CS you would see from a top laner at the competitive level would look similar to a bronze game. You just wouldn't have anywhere to go, and you needed to try to soak experience where you could, which made the game, rather than a 5v5 fully realized game, more like a 4v4 one until 20 minutes since both top laners were given the short end of the stick. It also came with another major issue, in that this looked nothing like solo queue. Riot has always done one thing well, and that they deserve credit for. They try to make sure that pro play and solo queue are similar enough that a solo queue player could tune into LCS one random Sunday and enjoy watching it. Maybe they don't understand everything, and they probably don't understand why Ezreal and Tom Kench is the bot lane that's picked every single game, because it's never picked in their bronze games, but they can watch it. At this time, solo queue and pro play looked nothing like in the early game, because the lane swap meta had a huge discrepancy between it happening all the time in professional games, while never happening in solo queue. It wasn't enjoyable to watch. Without a doubt, change will be required in some way, and there can be multiple reasons to change a game. No matter how much the glory days feel like they were perfect, we can't all always have our nostalgia goggles on. League cannot and should not be Season 3 forever. Change is a necessary and healthy evil that everything, even you in your own life, must incur at times. But, I'm not saying Riot has done a perfect job. Have they done a perfect job? No, probably not. And that's why we arrive here today. Let's talk about these gimmicky champions they keep releasing. Before we begin, let's get the definition of gimmick very clear. I don't necessarily mean something that's cheap. I mostly mean how forced some of their interactions are. How they get things added to their kit just because it's new and wow, I can't believe they can actually do that. Wow, good job Riot, you're so cool. Can you believe that Orn can shop without recalling? That's nuts, dude. Nice design, I bet your mom gave you that idea, Blake, Squad 5 Smith. Or the design of just because they can, like how Zaya and Rakan can recall together. It's cool. Kinda, ultimately not that impactful, I guess they can do it because it sort of fits with their theme as lovers I suppose, but it's not really that important. That's kinda what I mean by gimmicky. It's no secret that League has been releasing some very gimmicky champions for a long time. Definitely feels like every single new champion now has to have some new idea or new gimmick added to their kit. Something that no other champion can do. Let it steal summoner spells, let it steal your ult. Yeah, that's fine, don't even think about if it's balanced or not, just kinda throw it in the kit. This has become so bad that even players have been able to start predicting what a champion will do based on even just seeing what the champion looks like. They know what's going to happen long before they've even seen gameplay. 
what I tell you guys? What did I say when they first even mentioned uh, Kali Rework? What did I even? What did I say? What I tell you? Eight dashes. True. I I called it. Go find. Go find the VOD. I called it. True invisibility. I said that. One of the very first gimmicks in League's history could be traced all the way back to Gangplank. At one point, did you know that Gangplank could actually use Parlay to kill his own minions, up to and including his own teammates Heimerdinger turrets? I guess League used to be Dota. Anyway, this was removed, because it was seen as unhealthy, and because he was the only champion that could do it anyway, it didn't really make any sense. Why would one champion be able to break the rules of the game, while others have to play by the same rules? This is where I would say people have to be a little bit careful, because some may call Kane's shadow step gimmicky, because he can go through walls, but that doesn't inherently break the game, or mean he's not playing by the same rules, because of course, plenty of other champions have mobility that allows them to traverse over walls. Maybe aside from the part where he can do it on the edges of the map, I'll give you that one, but this is mostly not a gimmick. Better examples would be things like Orin being able to build not on the fountain as well as upgrade teammates items and his own items, Zoe stealing summoner spells and active items, Ivor not having to attack jungle camps but having this weird way of clearing the jungle, Silas stealing your ultimates and using them against you, Nico cloning allies and tricking you, Yumi being able to attach to an ally and be invulnerable and untargetable, and now the Mordekaiser rework. Holy moly, they released this information yesterday, did you see this? Mordekaiser can actually send himself and an enemy to the shadow realm removing both of them from the game and you and the enemy cannot see anyone else or attack anybody else you can literally remove the fed jinx from the team fight build full tank mordekaiser not die to her and then the rest of your team will kill the other four weak members of her team riot come on man really Champion design philosophy is hard, and I'm not claiming to be an expert, and I certainly don't have the level of talent that the rioters do in charge of champion design. Not even close. However, some of their recent designs come at many costs. One of them is the idea of nullifying old champions, and making old kits obsolete in favor of new champions. The Blood Harbor Ripper. It's metal. Holy shit. He's a support. Probably gonna be a top laner, to be honest. It looks like Nautilus is like brother. He looks nothing like Nautilus. What? What? That is a disgusting amount of HP. Oh! What? Wait a second. That's a long Wait distance. Wait a sec. I feel like before they would just put those abilities as like a Q and a, Q yeah. and a W. A more flexible Blitzcrank, right? They choose to design champions with these gimmicks in mind though, and you can see that by their development cycles. Nico and Silas were in development at around the same time, and during their process most likely shared very similar abilities and ideas. It's possible that Nico and Silas even swapped around some of their abilities onto each other's kits during development, such as Nico, the chameleon champion, could have just started out as becoming an enemy champion entirely, cloning herself, and then stealing their ultimate all at the same time. When you give champions new and interesting abilities that have never been seen before, as a viewer of pro play, this gives you something that's very exciting. The best players in the world who are complete masters of these champions show us these amazing plays we'd never imagined would happen. Imagine three years ago saying Faker could steal Nar Ultimate and do this. It's getting obliterated! Oh! Massive! Manages to steal the Nar! Faker turns around! He hijacks G2's chances! Listen to that crowd as SKT turn it around! Nico herself was designed on purpose to become a bottom lane AP carry threat, as well as Pike of course was designed on purpose to change up the game and change the role of support. Pike has his reset mechanic, on top of his Your Cut, which gives your allies gold for kills, allowing a carry and assassin support champion to be viable. When you design champions for a purpose, and with an expectation to change the meta with that pick, you have to be very careful. Riot has really dropped the ball on this in the past. The biggest fail of all time was the original Mordekaiser rework, where he was given a kit that was supposed to be a melee bot lane champion. During Season 5 Worlds, he was the most broken, unbalanced champion imaginable, and he was completely overtuned and unfair, thus receiving plenty of nerfs, and he's been almost completely unviable since then, requiring another full-fledged visual gameplay update rework, now just coming in a couple of weeks. There potentially becomes a point where things are just too far, and become too much. The more you deviate from what people know and are used to, the harder it will be to please the majority. That being said, if you try something totally wacky, new, innovative, and different, you'll be able to capture a new audience and get more players invested and interested. I am certain without a doubt the new Mordekaiser rework will do good things for him as a champion, spawning many new mains, refreshing his subreddit community, and reviving a dead champ into his final form, where he always should have been. 
Heck, maybe I'll even like playing him so much I'll make some videos about him. But what I'm also sure of is what made League iconic. It was his pizza feet. It was the 13 health potion start when potions didn't have a limit of 5. It was the will of the ancients, Mordekaiser. And even if it's just stupid nostalgia, I'll miss those things too. League is an ever-growing entity, an ever-growing experience, with new players and old players alike coming together to be the game that we love to hate and hate to love. And as the veterans and pioneers fade away, we make room for new stars, new players to step up to become the next generation of great League players. If League truly is a game that lasts for 25 years, we're still going strong then, and would be classified as the middle generation, those who were responsible for taking the game from very popular to a worldwide esport known and respected by the general public. Who knows? Maybe even your children one day will know Caps' name. Knight is ticking down. Here comes a heroic entrance, and Gorilla escapes with his life. Caps gets one. Oh! Oh! Caps is Yasuo is beautiful.